In this video, we'll learn about electron orbital diagrams. Before we start looking at our electron orbitals, we need to learn about one more principle that governs our orbitals, and that is the Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle says that a maximum of two electrons can occupy the same orbital, but we know that no two electrons can have exactly the same energy. They can't have the exact same quantum numbers. So we've learned about the first three quantum numbers. The last quantum number is the magnetic spin quantum number or M sub S. What this quantum number states is that the electrons can either spin in the same direction as the external magnetic field or opposite of it. So essentially we can have an electron that has a spin pointing up or a spin pointing down. This means the two electrons, even though they're in the same quantum number, they're in the same orbital. Now they're a little bit different. One is spinning with the magnetic field, the other is spinning opposite of it. So this is how we can have two electrons that occupy the same orbital. And so looking at the spin quantum number a little more. In 1920s, it was discovered that two electrons are in the same orbital, but they don't have the exact same energy. The energies are slightly different. And the way they did that was they had a beam of atoms going through a slit, and then it went through a magnet. The magnet would then cause the electrons to veer either to the right or the left. And the fact that the electrons veered to either direction indicated that they either had an MS that was what we call a positive one half or a negative one half, where it deflected either in the direction of the field or opposite of it. And so that means our spin quantum numbers can have either a plus one half value or a minus one half value. And so now putting all of these quantum numbers together, now that we know a little more about the spin quantum number. The principal quantum number, that's our large one, that states which energy level we're at. So that tells us the size. Is it the n equals one orbital, the n equals two, n equals three, n equals four? That's what the principal quantum number is. The angular momentum, what this one tells us, L, is the shape of the orbital. Is it an S orbital, a P orbital, a D orbital, F? That lets us know the shape of its orbital. The magnetic quantum number, that lets us know the orientation. Is it the PX orbital, the PY, the PZ? That gives us an idea of the orientation. And then finally, our fourth quantum number we know now is a spin quantum number. That lets us know, is it spin up or is it spin down? What is the direction of the electron spin? So all four of these quantum numbers give us information on exactly where the electron is. Every electron has a different and unique set of four quantum numbers. You can almost think of it as it's like the address for the electron. Just like every house, every apartment has unique address, every electron has unique address. So now when we're looking at our electron configurations, and first we'll look at them in two different ways. First we have our shorthand way, and then we'll look at an orbital diagram. So for the shorthand way, we'll see this again, is where we would write N, whatever the quantum number is. Let's say we're in the N equals two level. I'd write a two there. And then L, that tells me which shape the orbital is. Is it S, P, D, or F? So I might have a 2s. And then the superscript here, that lets me know the number of electrons in that subshell. So let's say the I have two electrons and I filled it up. So I'd say it's a 2s superscript 2. And that'd be one way you can write electron configurations by shorthand. Another way is to use an orbital diagram. Orbital diagrams can be used with either boxes, circles, or lines. I usually use a line and then we draw arrows pointing up and pointing down to represent the electrons. 
So remember, the electron spin can be a positive or a negative. So that's why one arrow is pointing up and the other arrow is pointing down. And so let's look at an example of these orbital diagrams. We'll start with an easy one. Let's start with lithium. So if I look at lithium and you look at the periodic table, lithium we know has three electrons in it. Now we want to know exactly where those three electrons are. With those three electrons, we'd want to start filling up from our lowest energy to our highest one. So our lowest energy happens to be the 1s. The n equals 1 level is always the lowest energy. Remember, that's your ground state. And then 2s would be our next one. And so what I do is I put two electrons into the 1s orbital because I know I can have a maximum of two electrons. So we have an arrow pointing up and an arrow pointing down. And then we use our 2s. Since lithium has only three electrons, I draw just one arrow. In this case, it doesn't matter if you have that one arrow pointing up or you could have had it pointing down. But so this would be an example of an orbital diagram for lithium. So now if we're looking at all these orbital diagrams, how do we know how to fill them up? Well, let's first start looking at a one electron system. So this would be for a hydrogen atom. This is what Niels Bohr did his model on was the hydrogen atom. And this is how he was able to get away with the hydrogen atom and get away with his model of a solar system type for the hydrogen atom. Is that when we have one electron, all the different energies and all the different energy levels become the same. They end up becoming what we call degenerate, which means n equals one only has the one s and then n equals two, since it has a two s and a two p, both of those are the exact same energy. Same thing for the n equals three. It has a three s, a three p and a three d. All of those are the exact same energy and it would continue on and on up the diagram. So this is how Niels Bohr can come up with his model for a hydrogen atom is all these different orbitals and subshells ended up being the exact same energy. Now, when we add in another electron, so if we have two electrons or more, all those energies are no longer degenerate. So our subshells all separate from each other. So in the n equals two, when the 2s and 2p were the same, now the 2p is a little bit higher energy. And then if we look at the 3s or the n equals three level, our 3s, 3p and 3d are all different energies going up to higher energy. And then our 4s and our 4p, those are also higher energies. Those are also separate energies. One thing to notice, now the different levels kind of start to cross our 4s is actually a little bit lower in energy than our 3d. All these energies from the subshells start to split apart because the electrons, since there's more than one electron, they start to repel each other. And those different repulsions causes the energies of the subshells to start to split apart from each other. But note that the orbitals within a subshell, so all of these three p's, they're all the exact same energy. It's only the S and the P that split apart from each other. All of the P's, the PX, the PY and PZ, those are all the same energy still. Same thing with the 3D, all of those five subshells, those are all the same energy as well. So now I'm sure you're asking, how do I know how to fill these up? You gotta fill them up from the lowest energy to the highest. How do I know how to fill them up? And for that, we use the building up principle. So our building up principle says the electron configurations for each element are built upon the previous element in the table. So if we know what the electron configuration is for the previous element, we just add one more electron in into the next orbital. And so you always add one electron at a time that is placed in the lowest energy orbital available. And doing that gives the ground state electron configuration for any atom. One thing to note, when we're filling up the orbitals in the periodic table, there are some exceptions. There's always exceptions in chemistry, and this is no different. 
So then when we write our electron configurations using the SPDF notation, it reads from the periodic table from the left to right and row by row filling up orbitals from the lowest energy up. See, super easy, right? Don't worry, we'll practice. You're asking yourself, how do I know how to fill up these orbitals? They start to cross each other. For that, we use a handy kind of little cheat device here. So when we're filling up our orbitals, you can either try to memorize this here, not quite the same, or you can look at the energies for your different orbitals. And if we write it out, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are all of our S orbitals. And then we know P starts at the N equals two. So we have two, three, four, five, six. The D orbitals start at three. So you have three, four, five, six. F orbitals start at four. And then we'll just start filling up using our arrows here. So we'll fill up the 1s and then we'll go to the next arrow and it's 2s and the next arrow 2p 3s. Next arrow 3p 4s. Then you go to the next arrow down 3d 4p 5s and then our next arrow 4d 5p 6s. It's that easy. If you can remember how to draw this and how to write this out you always know how to fill up your electrons and how to fill up your orbitals. And then so our last rule before we look at our electron diagrams is we look at Hund's rule. Hund's rule says that for the general orbitals, the lowest energy is obtained when the maximum number of electrons have the same spin. So we need our electrons to have the same spin. So when we're filling up orbitals, we fill across the same energy before we pair electrons. So before you pair the electrons, you fill up across the orbitals. And then by placing these electrons in different orbitals, the electron-electron repulsion is actually minimized. So that makes it a little bit more stable. So looking at Hund's rule, we can see using row two of the periodic table, we can see we'll fill up 1s, 2s, beryllium gets both filled up. Boron, now we start filling up the 2p. Then we go to carbon. For carbon, there's a choice. You can either pair the electron or put in the next box. If we put in the next box, that minimizes how close the electrons are to each other. So that reduces the electron-electron repulsion. So then with, with nitrogen, same thing. We can either pair up the electrons or we can put them all in their own box. So now the three electrons are as far apart from each other as they can possibly be. This will minimize that electron-electron repulsion. Once you have no choice and you have filled up all the boxes across like this, for oxygen, if we had oxygen, we'd have our 1s, our 2s, and then when we do our 2p, we'd fill up across, and then we'd pair the next ele that electron. And then same thing for fluorine. For fluorine, we'd have to pair up the electron. But you can see if we know the electron configuration of the previous element, all we do is add one more electron to it. And so that's what we mean by it's building upon, it's building upon the previous element. And then when we get down to neon, we filled up the entire 2p orbitals, the entire n equals two level. So then the next element, sodium, we have to start the th n equals three levels by using the 3s orbital. When we're looking at these orbitals and how they relate to each other in the periodic table, we can see we fill the orbitals based on increasing energy. So we start in the top corner here where hydrogen is, and then we go across periodic table, helium. That's our second element. So that's has two electrons. Then we come down to lithium and we go across the periodic table. And then we come down to the next row and we go across the periodic table. And then we come down to the next row and go across. So we can see we're just building up based on the periodic table. And so this would be our main group ones. That's group number one, two. These are our transition metals. They're sometimes called the D block, and now we understand why they're called the D block. 
because that's where the d orbitals first start. And then we have our other main group. And these are the noble gases at the very end. And so sometimes you might have heard this main group called the p block. Now you know why, because we start filling up the p orbitals. And now we know a little bit more why the noble gases are noble gases, because they are at the end of filling up an energy level. And then the f orbitals down here. So these would be more of our rare earth metals, the lanthanides and actinides. But you can see when we're filling up the different blocks, it's just going across adding on from the previous element. And so if we look at an example, let's say we're looking at, let's say let's look at iron. Iron is element 26. Iron falls right about here. So that means when I want to fill up iron, I would have my 1s, my 2s, see I did 1s, and then I did 2s, next would be 2p. So I have one, two, three, four. This is 2p. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Next is, oops, next is 3s. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, So now I've completed that one. So now I go to one, two, my fourth arrow which means I filled 3P. So I have 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. After I fill up 3P, I fill up the 4S. 19, 20. 21, 22. So then after 4S, I've just finished that. And you can see how down here, it's going from 1s, 2s, filled up the 2p, did the 3s, 3p, now we're on 4s, which means now I go to the, 4D, to the 3d. And that follows the arrows here too, because the next one here, 3d. So the d's we know have five So we're at 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. But you can see when we're filling up our orbitals, we can either follow our cheat sheet here, or you can think about how you're filling up your periodic table. And so now you guys should be able to start filling up your electron orbitals and drawing electron orbital diagrams. But remember, you're filling up, adding one electron from the previous element. We can either use our configuration here to help us out, or if you remember filling up the periodic table, how we fill it up, that can help you too.